Welcome back to the Strong Life Podcast. Special guest, Matt, the Immortal Brown. Been wanting to do this podcast for a long time. And uh, Matt, super excited that you're here. You know, we've been chatting through, you know, definitely Instagram and other social channels. I feel like it's been a long time. <clears throat> you know, I, I first came across uh, your fighting. I mean, they I think they featured you. I can't remember if it was the ultimate fighter, but they mm -hmm. featured you're training before a UFC fight and uh, you were training kind of the West side GPP style of uh, wheelbarrows sleds yeah. in the snow. So um, thanks for coming on. Very appreciative. Yeah. Well, that was, I was just about this the other day with one of my guys, we were talking about recovery and overtraining, how all these pussies use these words way too fucking much, you know? And I was talking about the early days at West side when I first got there and, Tom was an intern. He had just moved there. Me and him kind of came to West Side at the same time. So he didn't really know any better. I didn't know any better. So we were running like basically a full conjugate, you know, as if I was geared up like the other guys. And I don't know how the hell I got through it because we were doing GPP on top of it. And, you know, we had <clears throat> we had Louie over there just make it shit up all the time. You know, <laughs> I don't know uh, how I got to do it. Uh, but speak on that. I still remember actually uh, your first book sitting at West side. So which one? <laughs> uh, the I wonder which one <clears throat> the encyclopedia. Uh, yeah. Yes. The encyclopedia. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Still got it. Um, that's what I gave to my kids to read. Oh, yeah. They like strength and conditioning and, and I said, well, here's here's a lot of ideas for you. I gave them Yi systems. Which yes. Are, you know, this I, one. Okay. all those like body weight martial yeah. arts. Uh, yes. Yeah. The prisoner guy stuff. <clears throat> so, uh, I gave them that because, I mean, that's, you know, those are two very long, deep books. Um, and it's things that they could do anywhere. You know, they, they we have two separate households you know, my house and then their mother's house and they don't have weights there. I have a garage gym here. So I said, look, here's an in two entire books of shit you can do when you're at your mom. So don't give me any excuses. Love it. And then, and then when we're here, I gave them your book to look here. When you're here, you can go out back and carry fucking logs and get strong, you know? Hells dude, <clears throat> that shit built bad motherfuckers. That's what I, that's what I tell people. I, I actually, you know, my first, what what got me understanding how to train for combat was weekly phone calls with Louie. Um, how, how old are your kids now, Matt? Uh, my boys are 13. My daughter is eight. Awesome. I, I have a, a second edition. I'm going to mail it to you <clears throat> this week. But um, I like, I wanted the book for, to be for adults, coaches, teenagers, especially a teenager who will flip it open to any page and just kind of pull yeah. from there. <clears throat> so, you know, one thing I don't know a lot about Matt is your history before what I saw um, that like, uh, I guess it was like a UFC before a fight would happen. They would do these like mini films on the fighters. What yeah. were you, what's your background before you got into fighting? That's what I don't know. Uh, drugs and party. Ah, and so when you started, uh, um, was it MMA or was it called NHB fighting back then? Uh, so it was, it was kind of both <clears throat> at the time. There was still like NHB shows going on. Yep. Uh, the first one I did was, I think they called it MMA. It was called Chaos in the Cage in 2002. Um, but most of the shows that I went around uh, were usually called NHB. That one just... To be honest, I don't know what term they used. Yes, the early, that was, you're right, those early days. And uh, I know you're great friends with Mark Coleman. Yeah. So I, um, in wrestling, I came across UFC because my old wrestling coach, we went to Blockbuster and he rented a VHS tape. And he's like, you got to see this, this thing called NHB No Holds Barred Fighting. All the, yeah. rest, all the wrestlers are winning. <laughs> <clears throat> and so that's where I came across. So you're originally from Ohio? Yeah, a really, really small town. No one's ever heard of. Population of 200 in the middle of nowhere. So that kind of led to a lot of the drugs and alcohol and 
parting. I kind of, it was a very much a farmer town. Like I never went to a big city, never seen a skyscraper, you know, till I was, <clears throat> you know, over 20 years old. Uh, you know, just the world was very small to me. And I think my mind was just too big for that world. Um, and I wasn't exposed to a lot of things and um, to a lot of anger, depression, I don't know, anxiety, whatever kind of bullshit, you know, excuses, um, you know, but a lot of emotional issues. And uh, my outlet was drinking and, and partying and cocaine and meth and, and those things. So that was what led me down that path. And then um, the day that I found mixed martial arts was uh, the game changer though. Cause finally there was something, you know, I didn't, my, I grew up in this small town. My dad owned a machine shop. My uncle owned a welding shop. My, my papa, we called him grandpa owned a, a junkyard. Uh, my other uncle, <clears throat> he was a machinist too. Um, but the, you know, they all owned their own businesses you know, and they were all these small time, you know, working on tractors and, you know, shit like this. And, and I was like, dude, like this ain't for me, you know, now I was a prodigal child, you know, I, I went to, uh, you know, the um, career center vocational school for machining. And I was teaching the teacher <clears throat> more than he was teaching us. You know, I mean, I've been doing this shit since I was 10 years old, you know, <laughs> Like I was running mills and lays by the time I was a teenager, you know, I was a prodigal child. Like this shit, like school was easy. Like none of this shit gave me a problem, but I was like, dude, this ain't what I'm trying to do. You know what I mean? Um, so like I said, drugs, alcohol was the sort of my outlet for all that anger and uh, heavy metal music. You know, I related to that shit. And uh, fortunately I found some <clears throat> good music that, was actually positive and like a hate breed or, you know, like a vulgar display of power. Um, unfortunately, there was also intertwined with a lot of the negative shit too. You know, there was, um, well, Pantera was a huge one, you know, like the great Southern, <clears throat> you, know, you know, these certain albums, you know, had a lot of negativity to them, um, you know, and other, other bands and stuff too. But anyway, <clears throat> so, I, again, I found the martial arts. Who and, introduced you to the martial oh, arts? I myself. Well, sort how, of. Sort how did of. you? But, yeah. How'd that happen? So we were we were doing a lot of cocaine one night, and my buddy was supposed to go fight Wes Sims. I remember. Right? Yeah. From yeah, uh, come, Pat from Hammer House. camp. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Wes Sims Hammer House. Yes. Hammer House. Yeah. Oh, Hammer House. Crap. Sims. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This was, you know, a regional show. This was 2002, Chaos in the Cage. And um, my guy, my buddy, his name was Fat Joe, but mm. the rest of us, we're all just tagging along and, you know, we're doing cocaine and just partying. Mm. Um, so we get to the show. Wes didn't even show up, but, you know, we're sitting there in the crowd and this is like what you'd see on TV, you know, with the guy smoking cigars, betting on the fights. You know, there, I don't think there was a commission. Maybe there was, but they weren't enforcing anything if there was. And, we said, and I heard the guy on the microphone, he said, if anybody wants to fight the champion, you know, you stand up now. And I stood up and I was like, I'll fight the motherfucker. And it, about an hour later, I'm fighting this guy. I had to go across the street to get a, a mouthpiece. There was a sporting goods store. And and then uh, there was a restaurant across the street also. So I had to boil the mouthpiece with their microwave, fit the thing, um, come back, I borrowed a friend's cup just i was wearing the shorts that i wore to the show or whatever <laughs> whatever they were uh, this was a mark Matheny show actually he could tell about it he was he was a very popular ref in ohio put on hundreds of shows repped every base repped a lot of ufc's but anyway um i go in there and um the first guy kicked his ass no problem and then what was your background street fighting uh, street fighting yeah i mean no I, wrestling I, no, no wrestling. Um, I wrestled one year in high school, my freshman year, you know, yeah. that was, but uh, that doesn't really count, you know, especially in the little school we were at where like the math teacher is your fucking uh, wrestling coach, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because they need someone <laughs> to do it. So I had no background. So I go in and I said, I, I kicked a guy's ass. So I thought I was the shit. Um, so I did this a couple more times, kept winning. 
I mean, you know, I was a tough kid, you know. I mean, you know, I wasn't scared to go in there and fight. I mean, cocaine helps you not be scared too. Um, but then finally I went in and did it um, in Delaware, Ohio, and I got my ass beat. Who was yeah, it? Do you remember who it was? His name was um, Keplington, I want to say. Michael Keplington, something like that. Uh, you asked me too fast. If I thought about it, I'd remember. Um, but he was about to go pro in boxing, and I fought him in a kickboxing match. And he beat the fuck out of me. And I talked to him afterwards, and he goes, bro, he's like, you're tough as hell. He's like, I couldn't knock you out. You know, this guy's about to go pro, and I didn't know how to do anything. You know what I mean? But he couldn't knock me out, so... I decided, okay, I'm going to find a gym. So I said, okay, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to move to Columbus, which is where I still live, and uh, and find a gym. I'm going to sober up and go find a gym. Found a gym. Um, day one, it, it's a it's where the Hammer House was. Mm -hmm. You know, the Hammer House isn't an actual gym, right? It's The Hammer House is wherever Coleman shows up. Right? I remember <laughs> an old video of... Uh, I probably bought it on SureDog, a VHS, where they were kind of beating the shit out of each other in the Ohio State wrestling room. Mark Kerr and Mark Coleman yeah. prepping yeah. for Pride. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, anywhere. That was anywhere. the house that day. <laughs> and Kevin Randleman. Did you meet Kevin? Um, I met Kevin a few times. I wasn't close with him, but I, I had met him a few times. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I wasn't that close with Coleman back then either. Um, they actually weren't there that first day. Um but it was where they were training. But the people that were there uh, was a guy named Dorian Price, who's still my one of my best I friends. I remember and, him. Well, I see him, of course, on Instagram, but I remember him. He's yeah. the Muay Thai. Yep, still my Muay Thai. <clears throat> um, and then there was two other guys who were getting ready for a show that I can't remember the name of the show. Um, but it was... a really Monty Cox was putting on the show. So he had all the Militich guys on the show. I remember Robbie Lawler was on it. Um, I think Shogun might've even fought on it. Like there were some really big names on that show. And, um, you know, it was a nothing show, you know, nobody turned out for it, you know, but it was at the arena here. But anyway, these two guys were getting ready for it. The one guy fought in King of the Cage a bunch. And these were legit pros. Um, what I'm getting at here, this, when I walked in the gym this day, that's when I really got my fucking ass kicked. You know, I thought getting my ass kicked live by a, a pro boxer was getting my ass kicked. But when you can get your ass kicked and then you got you come back for another round or, you know, you tap out and then they do it again. That's a different experience because, you know, after a fight, you're always like, oh, I should have just done this or I should have just done this. But when you're in training, it's like, OK, well, you get another chance to do that and. I kept coming back and kept getting my ass kicked and never did figure it out. So was there no like uh begin, you know, beginner class introduce this guy to training? No. So <clears throat> this was actually, this was the, I, I came into their training camp. Oh. This was actually a karate gym. I said, Coleman was using it for the hammer house and these guys yep. were using it to train. So I was actually in, in the, you know, my my CTE may not agree, but I was blessed to be there that day. You know, I, I got to go with real pros day one. You know, the one guy was a purple belt. The other guy, I think, was a brown belt. And, you know, had good. both of them had good kickboxing. And, uh, you know, I it humbled me right away. But I still remember, you know, I walked out of the gym that day and I said, I'm going to succeed at this or I'm going to die trying. So yeah. what, um, you know, you're in this camp, you moved to Columbus. What were you doing for work? Oh God, you know, whatever. I, I went to labor ready sometimes. Like, I, you know what this is? Yeah. It's like when you stand and they like in a crowd and they pull you for jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Like the yeah. crack camp, you know, at five in the morning. Yes. Wow. Yeah. I would do that. Or, um, you know, I had like some construction jobs on and off and, um, Finally, I got a job at a place called Marzetti, you know, the salad dressing, T. Marzetti. Okay, I heard of it. Really good salad dressing. And they yeah. make Chick-fil-A sauce, too. So <laughs> that was kind of my job where, you know, I was actually able to sustain something. I worked there for like six months or something. And uh, 
but it, you know, it, it was always just like random jobs, you know, just enough to scrape by. Cause I knew what I wanted to do. I know I knew where I wanted to be. And again, I was willing to die to do this shit. Cause I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to accept any other option. And, and I, you know, and, and that's something I think is important. You know, anytime you want something, you can't accept, you can't have a plan B, you know, plan B, I call it plan bitch. The B stands for bitch. You know, that means you pussed out. That means that, you know, you have to go for whatever you want to go for with everything you got. And that's, you know, I, I would say to this day, like, that's the reason that I got as far as I did, you know, I mean, I didn't get a, a championship. I didn't get a title. Um, you know, I, I haven't won all my fights. Um, but I knew from day one that I was going to keep going until the day that I died. What, um, how old were you when you were around this stage of like living in Columbus and making it happen? When, how old? 24. <clears throat> 24 years old. So, um, who was kind of running Hammer House? Mark, I guess, when he wasn't fighting o overseas? I, back? I never even seen Mark. Uh, around the hammer house at that time How That's come? Just they were training uh, uh, you know a lot of the other guys that were there would tell me about him coming i just i, I guess I coincidentally missed him or you know coleman in that day too was a wild man i mean he's always been a wild man still is but it was a different level back then he was a real wild man back then so <laughs> probably better that we didn't hang out back then that's oh my god that's crazy so age 24 and what was your strength training looking like and how did you come across west side barbell who introduced you over there yes yeah, so that was <coughs> um from about 24 to 27 that was what i studied more than anything else and i'd read enough books to be you know a professor in kinesiology or strength science or whatever because I knew that the martial arts themselves, the actual art of jujitsu and Muay Thai and box, all these things was just going to be a time thing. I knew that that was something that, you know, I, I only had so much control over how fast the development was. I, but I knew with the, uh, the strength and the conditioning part, uh, the knowledge is out there, right? There's books, um, you know, the internet was starting to come about back then, um, you know, so I could re research stuff. I would go to the library all the time, just about every day and just read any book I could find on it, get on their internet uh, library computer, you know, because I didn't have a computer at home back then, you know, I didn't have a internet at home back then. So I would go there just about every day and I would read something about it and just get as much knowledge because I knew that was something that I could control. Um, so I learned, all, uh, at least I thought that I had learned a lot at that time. Um, and it wasn't really until I went to Westside that I realized everything that I learned was bullshit. <laughs> really? Because uh, I remember listening to you on Table Talk and you were, I don't know if this was after Westside, but you had read all the books that Louis recommends. And so uh, what were you reading before you got there that was, you think, bullshit? Um, yeah, that was like super training and, and all that came from Louie, you know, yep. that was, that was all after, um, I don't remember specifically, I think it was probably a lot more bodybuilding stuff. Oh yeah. Library is bodybuilding books. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I, like I was subscribed <laughs> to Fox magazine and, Hustle and, Fitness <laughs> and yep. you know, and, um, I always felt really gay reading it because I'm like, it's <laughs> a bunch of dudes in Speedos flexing for me. But well, there, there's a lot of knowledge in those books. You know, it's just not necessarily applicable uh, to what we're doing. They can be, I think. I think, I actually think a lot of bodybuilding work is underrated for what we do. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of good knowledge in there for your accessory work, yes. you know, in the bodybuilding world. Um, but it's just when someone does only bodybuilding, correct? You know, I think is a is a problem. But you know, you can pull from a lot of different, <clears throat> a lot of different styles and systems. Um, but I think that was probably the most of what I was reading. I ended up reading like the Ace Manual, um, was it ACSM maybe? 
because I, I ended up being a personal trainer. Yep. I, I got my certification for that. So read, you know, whatever the required reading was for that. And, you know, of course, like it's all, again, I'm not going to say it's bullshit, but, you know, there's a lot of junk. Yes. Right. I've seen guys that have gone through the cert. It's like, it's straight bodybuilding. It's lots of three sets yeah. of 10, stuff yeah. like that. Um, <clears throat> so when you met Louie, did he also introduce you to his buddy, John Saylor, the judo guy who's got the gym in his yeah. basement? <laughs> yeah. He doesn't talk about, they didn't talk about him enough. I thought that guy was really sharp. And there was a judo guy in my area um, where the coach, had, he's passed away since, but he was from Japan and he was the Olympic coach for United States, 88, 92. So when, uh, yep. When uh, Louis mentioned John Saylor, John Saylor mentioned this guy from Jersey. So you get to West side barbell who had introduced you to West side. Uh, so actually my friend <clears throat> who was married to Shane sweats, oh, yeah. uh, Shane sweats conjugate yep. guy uh, married to his sister maybe okay he was somehow um yeah yeah that was his brother-in-law so he knew about west side and he took me there one day and it's kind of funny the first time he took me there um i didn't really even think much of it because i was like dude like what are we doing here like it's just some garbage gym you know, <laughs> you know like the books i was reading you know the bodybuilding <clears throat> stuff or yep. the personal training stuff they're not mentioning west side barbell so i didn't really know where i was at and it, it was literally five minutes down the street from where i lived so so anyway so i'm you know checking it out and i'm like dude i don't you know i don't like what are we even doing here like like this is kind of silly you know like i can just go to the you know lifetime fitness or whatever um so actually it was probably two or three weeks later um i, I hadn't went back you know, he took me there. We did a workout. It was really hard, you know, but Who, I was like, was uh Shane took you through a workout or was there a group going on at the time? No, it was just me and and this guy that took me there. His name was Luke Zachrich. He fought in the UFC once okay. also, or a couple times. He was on the ultimate fighter with me. We were good friends back then. And um, no, we, you know, we just did a, whatever workout Luke did. I just did it with him. And, you know, I said, it was kind of hard. You know, I, I seen, I was like, wow, this is a, lot of different equipment that I've never seen, but you know, whatever, I, I didn't really think much of it. And then it was actually a few weeks later that I had uh, started researching because, you know, it just kind of, I was like, dude, where did I, like, where were we at? You know? And you know, so I just look up, you know, West side barbell and I was like, holy shit. Like I was at a fucking like Mecca of the world right down the street from me. So I ended up going back you know, I think, I think it was, it was probably a month, six weeks later, something like that. And I ended up going back. Um, and now I'm actually like really nervous because, you know, I just show up for the morning training. Like, I don't know no, nobody there, you know, and I'm just like, I hope, you know, this works out. Um, you know, actually I, I take that back. I walked in thinking like, okay, I'm just going to pay a membership. Right. And then when, <laughs> I, when I look in there and yeah. I see these guys, I, I still remember seeing, um, uh, still a great friend of mine today, Tony Ramos. He yeah. was benching like four or 500 pounds, you know? And I'm like, dude, what the fuck? You know? And uh, so anyway, uh, I remember Louis came up to me. I hadn't met him to this point yet, but he walked up to me and his nose was bleeding. His ears were bleeding. He had chalk all over him, you know, shirts off and you know, just wipes the blood off. He goes, hey, Matt, uh, this is Louis, you know, great to meet you. He, he knew who I was apparently. I must Luke probably had told him and he's like, yeah, welcome in and put me through a workout that day. And, uh, he put, actually, I remember he put me on the belt squat. It's funny. I'm, I'm all this is coming back to me because no one's really asked me about these experiences. Um, he put me on the belt squat and I felt like such a bitch. Cause he just had me doing marches yep. for five straight. He's like, you, you know, you got five minute rounds. Like you need to do it for five minutes. And, um, I felt like such a pussy cause I mean, the belt squat to make a bitch out of anybody. Right? It, cr it, cr it hits like muscles that you're not hitting with free weights. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we, I, when I was coaching at Rutgers, we ordered one and we were in this old building and it was delivered and they like put it on the basketball court 
and then the elevator like sunk through the ground and it like fit literally by like not even an inch on each side and we would use it and we would do that but i remember using it a lot like it was hitting your glutes and hamstrings and you were just burning everywhere just took you to a you know it took you to another place louis you know he really had such a way of he read something he imagined it and then found fabricators yeah such a brilliant guy just a a genius all around and the most dedicated to his craft of anybody yes. that's ever, you know, since, <clears throat> since Musashi, I think, you know, who he introduced me to also. Yes. Yes. Very true. Well, his, uh, or our first conversations were about wrestlers and he was doing timed stuff with them. Five minutes, six minutes. And I was like, time. I was like, what about when three sets first, of 10? When was your first conversation with Louie? Uh, probably. Oh, two on the phone okay, I'll call so that, him, that was long before me then okay call him every week and uh doris would answer sometimes louie i'd call him when i had a break from teaching and uh <clears throat> what struck me was at the time I, I remember clearly he was training three wrestlers high school kids and they weighed uh like two of them weighed 105 the other kid weighed 112 and they all benched 205 and i was like man i got a, a shot putter here who weighs like 185 and can't bench 205 and he's like yeah we today you know we benched and we worked up to like a heavy single a heavy triple he's like then i had them throwing medicine balls for five minutes i was like five minutes he's like yep then we dragged the sled for five minutes so i started doing that with our kids like everything was timed Mm -hmm. you know those old photos of the backyard i remember in the backyard i would do um 10 minute circuit then 15 then 20 minutes it was like a log tree log rope yeah. climb sledgehammer swing and a farmer walk and a partner hand walk and uh i when i watched our guys wrestle like i it hit me like i felt bad they were fucking killing people like hurting people you know nobody was training that way so the secret was not out yet and yeah. i still think people are still they got too fancy kind of what you said earlier matt of like they're everybody's so worried about they feel like it's too much and uh i i I wonder like years the older west side website they used to post fighter workouts there was like a fighter blog and it was crazy high volume and i'm I'm like are they just cut and pasting shit on here so i'm gonna like try to memorize a workout for you and see if it's like sounds like something you did so if it was a lower body day you might work up to like um work up to like a heavy triple on the sumo and then everything was five sets, five sets of glute ham raise, five sets of seated band leg curl, five minutes marching, and then, you know, five minutes sled while also carrying kettlebells. It was crazy high volume. Is that what they uh, were doing with you? Well, you touched about half of the workout there. <laughs> oh, God. What else? Well, then what happened? So we'd always warm up with the GPP. Um, most of the time be sled pulls, um, usually for 400 yards, sometimes for 800 yards. And then we would always end with GPP and you'd usually be more of a sprint type thing. Like we'd sprint the wheelbarrow. Um, you know, if it was snowing, that's when we'd go outside the snow and push the wheelbarrow, you know, be 400 yards through the snow. Um, sometimes, you know, push or pull a truck or a car. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes I have to carry the sled like with uh, barbell here, like in a zercher style. Yes. Um, and then you know we we come up, they come up with some silly stuff too. You know, like I don't know if you say silly. I mean, you know, it builds you a man. But I remember we one time we pulled the sled, and then we had the bamboo bar with the the um, kettlebells hanging off of it. But yes. this bamboo bar, um. I've never seen before it had I've never seen anywhere else it had a spring in the middle too I don't know if you ever seen this I never saw that one it might have been one off you know so so Jimmy probably made it Jimmy Seitzer definitely would make whatever Louie wanted (laughs) yeah yeah so so that spring I mean it was it was pretty strong but we put really heavy weights on it too so it'd be angled yeah you'd have to hold it angled, you know, versus, you know, just straight up. Right. Yep. Uh, 
and then I'd have to carry the uh, neck harness at the same time. So I got the sled, the kettlebell shaking everywhere, and the neck harness at the same time. That's just one example. <laughs> Holy. Did you feel like the volume was interfering with the MMA yeah. training? Yeah, at the beginning, um, it definitely was. Um, to an extent, you know, because what I felt like it interfered with was my conditioning not necessarily the um, MMA training because I was young, you know, I was like 27, 28, maybe 29. Um, I was, I had a very a high uh, GPP, very high capacity for GPP work um, and, and just muscular work altogether. Um, so I was able to get through a lot of those workouts, um, go train another one or two times in the day. And I was, you know, I was going to bed, you know, suffering, you know, <laughs> like it was, it was very common. I'd come home and, you know, go straight to the couch and not even, you know, I'd, I'd call my girl and say, can you bring me some food? Cause I can't get up to get it. <laughs> you know, damn. Yeah. That was, it was a very, very common thing. And, and, and I mean, there was, you know, there's days I remember driving home, just feeling like a zombie. Like I, I can't, and I, but you know i didn't know the difference because i thought you know this is just the way it's supposed to be and um and again this was very early on and then i think it, it didn't take too long where uh tom started realizing like this is this is too much you know and i, I started getting a couple of injuries here and there and he said we need to do a little bit different for mma fighters you know he's training uh probably the worst of it was when i started going to ohio state and wrestling with those guys and and the bigger the biggest problem was their their wrestling practice was at three o'clock and i'd go to west side because <clears throat> i didn't keep going with the morning crew so i'd get there after the morning crew so about 10 so it'd be about 10 to 12 and then you know rest for three hours which is enough time to eat and get changed and shower um and then i'd have to go straight to the wrestling workout and when i'd go to the wrestling workout you know they were very kind and I'm very grateful that they would let me in the room because I actually wasn't even allowed to be in there. Yeah. You know, the NCAA uh, regulations. Yep. So I would train with the Olympic guys more often, but you know, there were still like some uh, issues, you know, if, when the athletic director would come in, they'd make me, you know, run over to the corner and hide. And, you know, it was, it was a dangerous thing for them, but they would let me do it. Um, so, but that was a, a difficult time because I, I couldn't get rested up for that. And when I'd go in there to Ohio State, um, they didn't give a shit what I did before. Like, hey, we're letting you come in here. And they would do strength conditioning workouts at the end of their wrestling workout. Did they and do it that way? I, w I know Dustin was probably what, – when what years so were Dustin those? didn't come in until a little bit later. So this was okay. Lou's Ali's time. Oh, and yeah, Lou, yeah. Yeah, Lou, I mean, he would push hard. I mean, he would put a hard – and it wasn't every time that we do a strength and conditioning workout, but sometimes it would be, um, you know, just wrestling in your stance for seven, ten minutes, or you know what I mean? But he's going to push you at the end a little bit harder than you did the whole time. You no know, sometimes doubt. it would be, um, you know, just medicine ball carries or, you know, sprints, all kinds of different things. Re but wrestling uh, – back then, wrestling teams – would hire a wrestling coach and double him as the strength yeah. coach. And it was just like a fucking blitz session. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And I can tell you, it didn't really get any easier when Dustin came in either. <laughs> well, did uh, when I was at the college level, we would train at eight or nine, and then they would wrestle at three. So that extra, yeah. you were training from 10 to 12, we would train an hour, then they could eat have class take a nap that uh yeah. like six hours in between was helpful so um man wrestling yeah, and, at ohio state and was, was no joke and again i did i didn't i had i also wasn't a wrestler either so i'm getting my ass kicked the whole time and i'm suffering just to work through the workouts and on top of that we were doing at this time we were still doing you know four days a week of strength and conditioning with yes. tom when you did know, uh we were doing the you know upper body max lower body max upper body dynamic dynamic lower. we were doing yeah. tons of it you know what did tom when he said hey man this is fucking too much did he 
What did he cut it down to? What was the adjustments he made? Um, so we moved it to three days a week. What was that like? Uh, how did that split work? Mm, trying to remember. Full body dynamic when, day. I think it was just an upper, lower, and and uh, GPP day. Yeah, I, right. I might be wrong on that. Don't quote me on that. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe you know. Maybe we do this podcast again. And get Tom on here. And we could. Yes. Talk about this uh, together because he might remember better than me, but. Because back then, also, I didn't really study the West Side system back then. Um, so I'd studied a lot before that, um, around this time that we're referring to. Um, I basically went in and just did what I was told. You know, I, I once I learned about West Side and, you know, started getting there, um, in my head, this was a complex system that it's going to take me years and years to learn. I said, look, I don't have the time and energy for it. I'll just do what I'm told. Um, once I started doing it for a while, I started realizing, like, wait, this is actually really simple. You know, Tom would kind of break it down for me and yeah. uh, would say, dude, this is actually very, very simple. And that's what makes it so powerful is the simplicity. And uh, so I remember, yeah, we moved it down to three days. And then also the other adjustment, which I think, I don't remember if we added in together, if it was, um, just my own intuition is about six weeks out. I would cut it down to two days and usually about three weeks out. I wouldn't even do strength and conditioning. And I know Louie always hated that because he said, you're going to lose everything you built, you know? Um, uh, but I always kind of believed in that myself. Um, and, and maybe I would have benefited from doing a little bit more, um, a little bit closer, but, um, I don't know. I felt like that worked for me. What's, um, so now, like, let's segue into where you are now. You have your own gym. Um, what's do you have a fight team there, or what's the kind of uh, atmosphere you have going on there? Um, so I have a decent amount of fighters. Um, I have, let me see, professionally we have three guys. Um, all of them. Uh, one loss between all three of them. Um. I would say, let's see, there's four and oh, four and one, and six and oh. So only one loss in all of our pros. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, with the the fight team, quote unquote, it's not really a fight team. This is me and my friends that get together and we train and I help them, they help me, and we work together to make each other better. Um, if you I assume uh strength conditioning gym is probably similar to this, but the money isn't in fighters. And oh, yeah. I built I built my gym to make money. Yeah. Now I I built it also, you know, a lot of people take that the wrong way, but look, I built it also to help the community build a, a strong community for kids and for people to embolden themselves, empower themselves. There's absolutely all that, but all that doesn't happen without making money without me being, you know, the leader being able to sustain a lifestyle. If I have to go work a construction job all day, so I can come in the gym at night, I'm not really helping people. Right. Rule number one of a business is to make money because make like money. you said, if I am not making money, <clears throat> I can't hire great coaches. I can't yeah. bring in, you know, different things. And, um, I had a gym. We were part of like a martial arts building and I left it during COVID, but uh, Vitor uh, Shaolin, Vitor Ribeiro Shaolin, you know, I, Vitor's. Yeah. He's a, such a love, such a humble guy. I love that guy, but he had a couple, a few guys that were competing high level jujitsu. And he was like, Zach, he's like, you know, these guys <laughs> with the Brazilian accent, yeah. you know, he said like, they're not the business. He's like, most of my business is uh kids and uh, white collar businessmen who want to try to like get a little bit more fit and no self-defense he you know he was smart and um i also think like i don't know if it was like this in the early 2000s up to like 2010 i feel like today uh the the distract the lack of focus there's a lot of distractions so people are fleeting somebody might want to be a fighter and six months later they're not 
MMA fighting. They're just jujitsu. So now they go somewhere else. So I, I think you did it right. How, um, how long have you been open for? Uh, <clears throat> six years now. Oh, okay. And, you know, when I first opened, I was still competing. Um, I haven't competed for the last year um, due to uh, building my gym and the gyms do it better. And a huge part of that was because I did focus on fighters a lot earlier coming up and I had um, some really high level guys coming through. I had some uh, good success and I still wasn't making any money. And then, yeah. but, and I also to add to that, okay, I wasn't making money, but what was even more important was that I wasn't feeling fulfilled, right? Like, you know, uh, even just comparing adults to children, when I would see the adults, you know, get a purple belt or, you know, go win a competition, you know, a, a clap, cheer them on, pat them on the back. Fuck yeah. Good job, bro. Um, when I see these kids and I could tell you some stories with some of the kids, you know, changing their lives. I'm sure you'd have enough of them for me too. Um, you know, it, it, it'll bring a tear to your eye, you know, and it'll touch you. Yeah. It'll, it'll touch you deep, man. It, it'll really hit you hard. And when I started realizing um, that's the kind of power that I hold here, I said, dude, I got to put more into this. Because uh, when I first started, you know, I'd heard all that before, you know, the fighters don't make money and, um, you know, you got to focus on kids and the white collars and, and this and that. And I'm like, dude, I don't, you know, I'm like, dude, I'm a fucking warrior, man. I don't care about that. But, but then when you, again, when you go to a, a competition with the kids and you watch these kids that are scared out of their fucking minds, go out there on the mats by themselves and they end up, you know, performing well. And uh, th there's nothing that's touched me that deeply in my life. Um, I had one specifically, I'll tell a quick story where um, it, it touched me really hard. Um, I mean, it's not an extravagant story. I'm sure you'd have a, a, a very similar ones, but you know, he came into the gym one day and um, couldn't look me in the eyes. And um, his dad had been abusive to him. Um, his mom had just left his father and, you know, this, this kid was getting bullied in school and, and, it really hurt me, like all the things this kid had been through. You know, he's like eight, nine years old. And um, she said, I need you to, you know, make him stronger. And, you know, and usually when a parent tells me that, I'm like, well, you're the fucking parent. Like, I got an hour with the kid, you know. But this one, it was a little different, right? So, you know, I, I gave him a discounted membership. Um, we got a scholarship program for him. Got him going. And I hadn't seen him for about two or three weeks. You know, he's just taking classes and – um, I come back and the kid, you know, had his chest puffed out, you know, and when he hit my knuckles like that and looked me in the eyes, um, I said, man, this is what it's fucking about, man. Th this is what this fucking business is about. Like, fuck these fucking fighters, man. Wait till like you're going to get an email from these kids 20, 30 years from now about how you change their life and how they're a better dad. It's like, yeah, it's and like hits you in the heart so that's oh, yeah. that's amazing um what were like you know when you were going to make this change to the business model what did you do sit down and map it out or did somebody say matt this is what you need to do how did it start the uh, evolution well i'm still working on that <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's business a, yeah that's a never ending process right um I'll tell you a few of the things that I did though was first I had to change the culture. Um, and, and that's a deep process, right? That's a, a long, hard process, uh, rebuilding the core values, rebuilding the mission. Um, and then recently we just brought on a business consultant group, you know, that, that works with martial arts gyms. Um, and I wish I had done it before. And, and that's some advice I would give to any, body who's opening a gym or, or any business for that matter. Um, and cause I just, I don't know why I never thought of it. You know, I kind of thought like, like, well, I'm a famous UFC fighter and I know fucking every martial art through and through, like, of course I just put up a sign. We're going to fucking show up. Right. And they did. So it kind of reaffirm um, exactly what I was saying, which was a negative thing. They almost shouldn't have shown up. And then I would have said, damn, I need to fucking fix something. Get a but coach. Yeah. yeah. So I said, okay, well, 
I need to get a coach. And then, and when I met um, my current business consultant, you know, the first thing he did was look at my numbers. So, you know, and I, I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to show him like, yeah, you know, my numbers are pretty good. Right. And he's like, bro, he's like, he's like, I got a, over a hundred gyms doing triple that. You know, and I was like, oh, okay, well. That's all you need to hear, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, not now I'm embarrassed, right? And, you know, it's the same the same with lifting and martial arts and shit, right? It's like, are, are you going to go into a championship level fight without a fucking coach? Yes. You know, and if, you don't, if you're not looking at your business as a championship fight, then, you know, what are you even doing? The, uh, yeah, I mean, when I'm not with a coach or in a coaching group, uh, my performance in business is less because when you have a coach, you don't want to get on the next phone call and be like, yeah, man, I'm in the same spot. You're like, it's, yeah. you're, it's embarrassing. A little it's bit of accountability there, right? Yeah. That accountability is huge. And, and, and how um, long, have you, how long have you had your business? Um, I started in Oh two out of my parents garage and backyard. Then in 2003, my wife and I bought a house but the house had to get gutted. But the first thing that we rebuilt was the two car garage. So for a year I was running my business out of the two car garage, the backyard, the playgrounds while we would get the rest of the house built. And then in 2007 was the first warehouse uh, that I rented. And so, uh, you know, I wish I'm, I wish I bought a building, you know, I always say what it could have should is just, that's, that's bullshit. Yeah. So now yeah. it's um, real estate. Uh, we'll, we're going to get into some real estate, by the way. So that's an interesting topic. But well, I'm well, like, man, it. I've been renting since 07. So uh, what's 2024? Yeah. So like, you know, just shy of 20 years renting. Ah, damn it. No, Not good. Okay. But, you know, it, it's uh, what, what I was kind of getting at there is like, okay, you've been you've had a successful business over, over 20 years now. Yes. And you still have a coach. I, you know, I was always investing in if, even if I didn't, wasn't in like a coaching group, I was getting business newsletters with monthly CDs and I would sit down and study and immediately take action. That was my rule. I was like, okay, this is a $500 a month newsletter. You need to make, five thousand dollars back this month so i gamified it and um, i think also uh when i was younger being young you got a lot of energy you don't have kids you're more risk taking you know i was like i'll fucking sleep in my car and do whatever it takes right. to build this but you were talking about culture matt and i wanted to you know i chatted about it right before recording there was a time where you moved to colorado and uh trained at another gym and so it removed you from your roots. Uh, you know, how did it af affect you in a good way, in a negative way? What, what do you, you know, getting up and moving? How, how was that? Um, it was good and bad. So I, me and Tom had sat down and talked about it one day. Um, basically, I, I just didn't really have a lot of training partners here. Um, and I had an offer to move to Colorado where I was getting sponsored to live there, basically. So I basically uh, lived there for free and got to just train all day. Um, and that was the good, um, you know, lived a great lifestyle. I love Colorado. I think it's the best state geographically in the country, um, certainly has its issues, you know, politically and <laughs> culturally and things like that doesn't necessarily fit my vibe, but yep. geographically like the mountains, you know, are amazing. Um, so in those terms, it was good, but exactly what we're talking about culturally, it was a shock. You know, the people out there are different. The training out there is different. I was around tons of fighters, but they lived and trained very differently than me. And I, I still have great friends from out there, um, but they weren't my vibe. So I honestly, I probably would have been better off with my three or four training partners here than I would than I was out there with 20 training partners. And I thought that was what I needed was I need to be on the mats with, you know, guys at my level every day pushing. And, um, and that's why I also kind of steer guys away from going to the bigger gyms, you know, 
And I, I guess some people like that. They like the sizzle. They like being around, you know, usually when you look at these big gyms, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of stars there, like a kill cliff or ATT. You know, there's a lot of stars there. Right. But realistically, there's two or three guys that are performing well, right. That are actually at a high level doing big things, you know, working towards championships. Now there may be more than that in some places. I don't know, but that's realistically pretty much the norm and your ability. What I had changed was I actually funny enough. That was when I kind of started studying Musashi a lot more and Louie had always pushed me to study Musashi and I, I just never really did, but I read the book of five rings. I was like, yeah, it's all right, whatever. Uh, but he had a quote that hit me really hard. And he said, uh, everything is within, right? There's nothing outside yourself to make you better, stronger, faster, richer. Everything is within search for nothing outside of yourself. And when I heard that, that was what prompted me to move back to Ohio. I said, I don't need all these guys around me to make me better. What I need is me to make myself better. And, you know, that's, that's a little bit of philosophical stuff there, but that was what, that was what changed my life right there. Um, I stopped looking externally for the answers and started looking internally. Yeah. That's like complete opposite of what's really going on now in sports with um, the transfer portal and just kids are going to, you know, I trained a kid who was at Penn state, then Rutgers, then Michigan, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, they're just always going, but uh, very interesting. Yeah, you coming back to Ohio and West Side, it's like reminds me of uh, Apollo take Rocky to Tough Jim. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yes. uh, that was Yeah, I mean there's a, there's a lot lot to that, but um you know, it, that was just something that really hit me hard and um I've continued to carry that um through my business too, right? When when my business isn't doing what it should be doing. I don't blame my employees. I don't blame others. I blame myself, right? It's my name on the fucking wall. And that's been a a powerful thing. Um, You know, where I got divorced when I came back, right? That was one of the first things that happened to me. And that's a, can be a trying time for a lot of men. Right. And I think uh, part of what makes it such trying time is that constant looking for someone to blame. And they're constantly blaming others. And that's why, you know, they want to, they get angry or depressed or all these different things. And it's like, no, that's when you have to look the deepest within yourself. And that's where the fucking answer is. Yeah. And that's uh, why I have Masashi tattooed on my arm. I love that. Because that's, that's the shit that, you know, is really meaningful in life. And, um, you know, it's the same it's exactly what I was talking about with, you know, these kids that come in and their parents are like, yeah, my kid, you know, he needs this, this, and this. And, you know, they're, they're just looking everywhere for the answer. And it's like, can you take a time to uh, a, a one minute to look in the fucking mirror, figure it out? Like, where do you think he's getting this shit from? You know? And so anyway, I guess when we talk about cultural issues in the world, I think that's probably one of the biggest cultural issues. Um, you know, when, even if you go like politically, right? Like if you look at the, uh, I know I'm getting a little bit of a tangent now, but you know, if you look politically, right? Like the, this country was built on individual individualism and freedom. And, and now it's all, every time something happens, everybody's like, well, Trump did this or Biden did this or, you know, and they're they're just looking for someone else to fix it. And they're like, well, we need better health care. Like, you need a better goddamn self, motherfucker. Yes. Jesus, put that on the jumbotron of Times Square. <laughs> um, you're right. I mean, our country, you know, I don't know, you know, how we're going to turn things around. It's uh, to me, like I see the schools, the this, the that. But I think at home, you know, I have two kids. Yeah. My kids are a little older than <clears throat> than yours my daughter will be 18 you know the end of summer my son's almost 16 and um you know you're right at home like if mom and dad blame and make excuses your kids think that is normal mm-hmm. same thing with 
exercise. Um, you know, when I opened this gym in this town 11 and a half years ago, my kids essentially, they grew up in the gym. But also when we moved to this house, I had a, we have a high ceiling in the garage. First thing I did was climbing nice. rope and rings. And so nice. my son would see me doing it. So when my son and daughter were a year and a half and like two and a half, they were climbing rope. And that was my first lesson as a dad. Oh, they think this is normal. You know, yes. they think it's normal. They see dad pushing the truck up the street, sprinting up and down the sidewalk, jumping Love the it. stairs. Yeah. They're like, Oh, <clears throat> it's normal. So I remember my kids were, you know, like six and eight and, uh, they came downstairs and my daughter like wrote a workout on paper and they were working out for fun, you know? And like, yeah, people don't do that. Yeah. It was like uh, 50 box jumps on and off the couch, <laughs> like <laughs> all, all kinds of stuff. And I was like, Oh man, this is great. So when, you know, when parents ask me, how do I get my kid eating better doing this? I'm like, if you do it, they think it's normal. Back so, the, and you know, speaking <clears throat> on that, I mean, that's it exactly one of the the biggest uh i don't know metaphors or analogies uh to what dude if you look at nutrition these days what does everybody do they're looking for a fucking hack they're looking for a quick shortcut they're, look, they're everything's looking everything's biohacking yeah this is why fucking that faggot gary breck is so famous right that's why this fucking dork dave asprey is so famous right yeah. none of motherfuckers are saying None of them are going to look at you in the face and say, you know why you're fat? Because you make the fucking choice to be fat, dickhead. <laughs> that is li like, like, you know, you that fucking donut. That's why you're fat, motherfucker. So we've gotten away, you know, gyms. I, did you ever go to a commercial gym? Like not a light, like in those late 90s, early 2000s in Ohio. Did you ever go to like a mom and oh, yeah. pop type gym? Oh, yeah. You know, you could just smell it. There was something about them. And uh, I, to this day, I always say, man, like I would still want to open up a gym that's like that, where it's just like this place of work and nobody's got AirPods in and guys are fucking lifting heavy. And a young kid has to get the balls to ask the strongest guy in the gym. Hey, how do you do? How do you do this? Um, or. You know, I always say I had to work so hard with hopes that I earned the respect yes, you know, of, yes. of those uh, top dogs in the gym. But those days now, are where gone. Where I grew up, there wasn't really gyms. Like, I mean, it literally was not just farming town, right? Yeah. Like like the big city to me, um, it was called Jamestown. There's a population of 15,000. Like that was the big city to me, you know. It wasn't a gym there, um, but but then when in the early two thousands when I started living in Columbus, I would go to the bodybuilding gyms and exactly what you're talking about. You know, I I would see these strongest, you know, World's Gym. Um, I, I can't remember the name of this other one. It, it changed the name. It's still the same gym. It's Metro Fitness now, but it was, you know, something else back then. And and it was, I mean, you would see these jacked motherfuckers everywhere. You know and and yeah, you wanted to earn their respect. That's exactly yeah. what you like. You wanted to like, impress that guy. And of course, you know, there's like some fit girls here and there, you, you know, and you're going to put an extra plate on when they're around. And, <laughs> that know. was early. That's trying to, yes. Yeah, so that was the early days before social media, Ohio, uh, the state of Ohio has been known as a Mecca of strength, strength coaches, um, strength and conditioning, bodybuilding. You know, when I followed bodybuilding in the early days, Mike Francois, Mike Francis, I don't know how to say his last name. He was training out of Westside. Mm -hmm. You know, do you know who that is? He's a pro bodybuilder. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. But I, he know. was a he was a savage. But he trained at Westside, and then in the evening he'd go to his bodybuilding gym to do yep. his uh, other stuff. But um, I nah. want to uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I. I I was into bodybuilding back in the day specifically to learn everything. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I, I really hate bodybuilding. I, I, and now it's, uh, I feel like it's just chemical warfare. Like I see guys, they're fucking huge and they're doing lat pull downs with like 130 pounds. 
Um, I grew, you know, where I really got busted, my chops, you know, was uh, a bodybuilding gym that I call it's like the West side of bodybuilding. And everybody was lifting heavy. And, uh, you know, I saw a woman there bench 315 and the uh, just the the atmosphere, the, the music was so loud. It distracted you from trying to talk to your training partner because you couldn't even fucking hear it. But the the music was made from like bouncers in the city or they had like DJs from the strip clubs making like the right, CDs. Right. And it yeah, was just the, the unspoken like the- law was work, hard work. Yeah, that, that's what, you know, what I was exactly what I was gonna get at. You know, the now it's with social media, particularly, um, you know, bodybuilding isn't bodybuilding anymore, right? Now it's, you know, how can I look good on camera to get some likes? You know, and there's so many um, fake motherfuckers out there, and um, and I never really cared for the the sport, if you want to call it that, to start with. You know, I I just. I think it's weird to like look at dudes and speedos flexing for you, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I always had a mad respect for it, you know. It's the journey, uh, you know? yeah, yeah. All yeah. the training and diet. I remember when I was finished competing, I felt empty because it was six months of such discipline. I mean, I I remember. I don't know if I shared the story before. Man, I had the hottest girl over my house, and at eleven o'clock hit, and I just got up and shut off the TV. I was like, "You got to go." Like I was going to bed at 11 p.m. No matter what, I was waking up at 7 a.m. Whether my class, I had night classes or classes at 10. I was waking up at seven. I mean, all I wanted because I could control the effort. Yeah. To me, that was like the beauty of it. What about the evolution of MMA, Matt? Like now, what what have you seen with it? Because you're coaching. You're still. Are you going to compete again? What do you think? Um, I'm a little up in the air on it right now. Uh, maybe, what, well, maybe not. What do you see with uh, how has it evolved? Is it more of a technical? What is the evolution you've picked up on? Yeah, the the technical <clears throat> aspect's been amazing. I mean, we we've, we've seen so many new techniques, and uh, one thing that I say that I've learned is that there is no right way to do this shit. You know, we keep thinking that there's a right way, and then you know, you know, hands up, and you know, in a perfect stance and then leo de machita comes along and fucks you up with his hands down you know or, or wonder boy or you know that there is no right way, you know or you say don't go for leg locks and then ryan hall comes along and fucking breaks your ankle you know there is there is no right way it's a true art and it's truly a journey um the unfortunate thing that i have seen that i think has trickled down to a lot of the lower level fighters is the with the advent of social media is people trying to get famous on social media versus just simply putting in the hard work, putting their nose to the grindstone and working their way to the top Um, because it has worked out for some people um, like a Sean O'Malley, right? Like he was very famous on social media before he became champion. Um, And, and, you know, good for him. Very, very skilled, you know, certainly puts in the work. And I think a lot of the guys coming up though, forget that he did put in the work. They forget that he did the grimy sessions uh, that he got dirty a lot, you know, he got beat up a lot uh, along that path. He just coincidentally was smart enough to do the social media along with it. And I think um, that's kind of the one part that I don't like. And then, you you know, you kind of see some guys that, you know, maybe get, I hate the word deserve, um, but they end up getting things that they don't deserve. Um, you know, they not haven't, haven't necessarily earned things. Um, Seems like can't. some guys are in a pro fight where they didn't like, I don't know. I don't know. They did one fight. Now they're a pro. I, I've seen stuff like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was just, that's, that's been prevalent in MMA since the beginning, unfortunately, which has really been silly to me. It's something I've, I've really harped on my athletes about that. Um, God, I, don't, I can't even think of any that have truly listened where, where I'm like, Okay, if you guys came up as a wrestler, you've had two, three hundred wrestling matches. If you come up as a boxer, you've had a hundred, two hundred boxing matches. If you yeah. come up as a kickboxer, you know, whatever it is, like you've had tons of competition experience. <clears throat> I see so many of these guys that come in, do five or six amateur bouts, and then they want to go pro. And my brother, like, you don't know how to compete. 
like you do not know how to show up that night yet. You don't like you haven't been through the bullshit. You haven't woke up with a sickness and still had to go compete. You know, you you haven't um you know had your girlfriend break up with you the night before. <laughs> you know, these kind of things come up all you haven't had stomach sickness or ate the wrong meal. You haven't, you know, had a, a terrible night's sleep and you know, or whatever. You know, there's things that happen, you know, like like I've, uh, I mean, I, I, I give a million examples, you know, of things that have happened. And, you know, I was fortunate that my mind was always single purpose enough that I was able to deal with whatever, because I did that exact mistake. I was that guy when I walked in, I was telling the story about when I walked into a gym before I walked in and I said, I want to be a UFC fighter like day one, you know, with no training at all. Like, what do I got to do to get to the UFC? The guy that comes in does that today. You know, I'm like, dude, just get the fuck out of my gym. I don't want to hear this shit, you know? Um, and it was a different world back then too, to be fair. But that was that's not the kind of guy I want in my gym, right? So because you know that he's not going to put in, or you got to assume that he's not going to put in the work. I mean, maybe the one in a million actually will, but... Um, and I think that's the one thing that's been lost is just that hard work, you know, and, 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 and loving that hard work. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if, I, I don't know how much you see it in your world, but I don't see these guys, you know, falling down at the end of their training sessions a lot and saying, Oh, that was awesome. It's too perfect. I think now every like, yeah, is is it's too everything is too perfect even you know we've had to evolve i've mentioned this on our podcast the training you know in those early days i didn't need speed and agility because my football players played pickup basketball they also played basketball in the winter they were athletes and uh, i heard a coach the other day he said, it's not even fun to watch lacrosse. He's like, it's too perfect. He's like, they train all year. They go to club all year. It's like this perfect mm, thing. Yeah, it's not like there's anything. And, you know, when you mentioned you showed up at that first MMA fight, um, in my early days <clears throat> uh, before I tore my ACL that got me into strength and conditioning, I trained out of this place that um, he may have refed your fights. Uh, Big Dan, the ref, Dan Maragliata. Is he oh, ref? Yeah. So oh, Dan yeah. owned a place in Elizabeth, which is a inner city outside of Newark airport. You know, it's a street place. And I looked up shoot fighting because back then um, there was NHB. They were shoot fighting. I, oh, this place, the shoot fighting. I would go there. Dan was 75% of the time not there. And you would just spar with random people and I could wrestle. So I'd be fucking taking people down. Guys were choking me, arm locking me, fucking me up. But I could take everybody down. And uh, I remember Dan would host something called Fight Night twice a year. And uh, he would rent out a high school. And there would be uh, shoot fighting. Uh, there would be grappling. They didn't even call it jujitsu, grappling. And um, one guy didn't have somebody to fight. Somebody didn't show up. So Dan just shouts to the stands. Hey, like anybody want to fight this guy? And I think he weighed like 165 and a Brazilian was there and he stands up and he's like, I'll fight. Oh, no, the Brazilian was fighting and the kid was from a place in Philly. I think it was called Fight Factory. OK, this uh, is like this is like I'm, th I'm thinking it's like 2001. OK, or nine or 2000. OK, it's, I'm like. I remember this and the, the kid from fight factory is like, I'll fight him. Like, okay, 20 minutes, just like what you're saying. And um, <clears throat> that kid was like 165. The kid from Brazil was 130. And um, man, the kid from Brazil was getting ground. It was ground and pound. That was the big thing back then, as you know, and uh, man probably had his rib broken, but he would not give up. He would not give up. And uh, the, I don't think there was even like a time limit. And so something like 25 minutes in, he finally uh, choked. He like guillotined the other kid. But uh, it was such like respect and guys willing to. He was there to watch his teammates fight. And they're like, this guy's got nobody to fight. He's not didn't show up. Kid stands up. 
It's like, I'll do it. Well, and, that's a uh, beautiful thing. Yeah, uh, it's totally. also when we talk about the evolution uh, in this day that we're talking about, which was my early days. And obviously you've been around in those early days. Like we fought to fight. That's why we fought because we fucking loved it. I, I seen, I remember one guy, you know, Ohio used to have more shows than anyone else in the country. Ohio had a show on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, very commonly. Like you could go to three different towns. And I knew a guy who would fight Friday, Saturday, and Sunday regularly. It's crazy. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't a good fighter either. You know, I mean, he wasn't, you know, out there, he wasn't a world beater. You know, he, he was never going to get to the UFC or anything, but, but we just loved it. And, I mean, we would take a fight anywhere, anytime. We just loved doing it. And I don't see nearly as much of that anymore. And the, and all this stuff we're talking about is exactly kind of circling back where this is why I don't have a fight team. This is why I train my friends. Because I say, look, if you're my friend and I see your passion, then I'm going to help you. Is I got a lot of knowledge I can give you. You know, I, I've been around this shit. I know I'm, I'm, I'm trained under a lot of guys. I got a lot of shit I can give you, but I'm not going to give it to you if it's not for the, if you're not here for the right reasons. If you don't love this shit, if you're not willing to die to do this shit, you know, if you care so much about your life that, that, you know, you care if you live or die when you walk out of that cage, then you need to go to college. Like you need to be willing to sacrifice your life every time you step into that fucking cage. And I feel like that's just kind of how we came up back then, the exact times that you're talking about. Like that was the mentality. Like, like, oh, we gotta you get you guys need someone to fight? Well let me get warmed up and I'll be in there. That, that sounds awesome. like sounds like that one dude you're talking about, his training was the fighting on the Friday, Saturday, yeah. Sunday. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Because we didn't I, know how to train. All of our training was fighting anyway. Yes, we didn't drill like Dan. Yeah, we didn't know what drilling was? I, I I always get like I'm like I hope Dan doesn't get upset with me when I say this, but Dan didn't. I remember my first night. Dan was teaching a flying armbar. Okay, so my fucking first night there, and so like we didn't really learn much. Then we were sparring. So it was it was called Bam, a Bayside Academy of Martial Arts. It was like whoever was there to train and then you like drilled for very little and then it always segued yeah. into sparring. Uh, but you know what's Matt? It just sounds like I miss the purity. I the miss purity. the fucking purity. Like even when I train, sometimes I'm like, fuck, my business is is my training. But lately, I just keep my phone in my car. I don't want to be touching my phone while I'm training because then I'm not training. And so kind of, you know, that that's always like on my mind. But um, let me ask you one last question. You know, you're, you're run down here. So we're talking about business. And I was thinking about this because I watch your videos. Um, I'm not sure if you're flipping the houses or just renovating and renting them. But somebody said to me, they're like, man, if you don't have like a million dollars in your bank account, you shouldn't even fucking think about real estate because it's going to take you away from, let's say you own a martial arts school. You need to focus on that thing that's making you money. And so um, I would love to hear like the last video I saw that you um, were renovating a house. That house looks like fucking shit. <laughs> so yeah, I was I, like, I, if I saw it, I think I would be like, there's no way I'm fucking fixing this. So I want to hear kind of some of the uh, idea behind this and what's going on with the real estate. Well, I think tomorrow we're going to have the updated video on that house and what we turned it into. Actually, I was going to take the video today, but the contractor showed up late and it wasn't finished. So, um, you know, that's just kind of shit you got to deal with. And you know what? There is something to be said about what uh, your guy was saying, where focusing on that one thing and just hammering in on that. Um, fortunately with me, I have a good business partner and so it's, and I have a good team that I've built out. So I don't have to put all my energy into that all the time. Um, and it still continues to grow and build. And, and that's just a matter of building a good business, right? Like that's yep. just, that's what building a business is, you know, it's, and I think that was something I confused at first between building myself a job and building myself a business, Right. And yeah. I first built myself a job 
And then I said, okay, well, I need other people to do this so I can have a business. Yes. And don't get me wrong. I, I could absolutely spend 24 hours a day working on it and it would probably go quicker. Um, I just happen to be, I've been in real estate for a long time now and I owned a decent amount of properties and then I got divorced and lost them all. And now I'm rebuilding this portfolio. So currently I have two Airbnbs. Um, I've liked that business um, for a couple reasons. And, you know, a guy might say his number might be, you need a million dollars before you get into real estate. But even if you got a hundred K, which, you know, when we fight, you know, we get lump sums and it's like, well, you know, what are you going to do with this money? You just going to live off of it until the next fight. I mean, that's one way to live. I did that for a long time. Um, but when you're getting, you know, up in that six figure mark, you know, you need to put that money somewhere where it's going to give you a return, even if it's a minimal return. And real estate is, in my opinion, just one of the best investments that there is. I mean, there's a lot of arguments for different types of investments, depending on how passive or how active you want to be, um, uh, depending on, you know, the types of returns you want to get. You know, th there's obviously a lot of details to that. It's not for everyone. Um, but being that I've already been involved in it and understood the game a little bit, you know, still learning all the time with that. But, um, you know, I just started rebuilding my portfolio. And now um, the videos you're speaking of are, are flip houses. And are they Ohio? I feel like I yeah, saw yeah, one yeah. out of, oh, I, I, like, I feel like I, I like, saw one out of state in Texas or something. Maybe I'm wrong. That's an Airbnb vacation okay. property. Yeah. Um, the flip houses. Uh, I'm fortunate that I have a very good contractor that his entire business is flipping houses, his, his, his construction business. That's what he does. Um, he has a lot of investors that never even see the houses that they buy, like that they'll put in the money, he'll go uh, flip it and they'll sell it, make a return. And they don't even ever see the house. So, I could be that hands off if I wanted and, and be that passive. And when you're getting, you know, a 10, 15, 20% return in six months, three months of this, this house here, we're going to get in four months. Uh, the one you're referring to, it's going to be a four month return. And um, assuming that it sells, it's going on the market tomorrow. And I believe it's going to be under contract by the weekend uh, being, you know, the area that it's in and everything. Um, who does the, how did you meet the contractor, by the way? How'd that happen? That's a funny story, actually. So he invented a little light system. Um, he's a, you know, he, he's a contractor, you know, he's an inventive guy, right? He invented this light system and he wanted to try it in martial arts. Okay. If, if it would help, you know, sort of uh, wrap it on the bag, right? The light lights up, you punch it. Oh, okay. Those things. And, um, you know, and I basically told him, like, look, it's already been done. You know, you're you're in an uphill battle here. You better put a lot of money in this. And he actually, <clears throat> I introduced him to a friend of mine who does a shooting. He's a um, military guy and trains people to shoot. And he um, um, what is it? Uh, uh, adapted these lights to be on targets. So now when you're shooting, instead of the, um, you know, you just, you know, pull the trigger whenever you want, right? It lights up and you pull the trigger, right? And, you know, little things like that. Um, but anyway, that's how I met him. He'd come to the gym and um, I was already, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> oh, sorry. I was already uh, looking at a flip house and I was putting together some crews um, to go, um, do the construction on this app, uh, do this, do the rehab on this house. Yep. And he said, he said, well, you know, you're going to have to deal with, you know, five, 10 different crews, right? You got to have a flooring guy. You got to have a drywall guy. You're going to have to have a demo crew, you know, exterior, all this, a roofing crew. He said, or you can just hire me and I can just do the whole thing for you. Um, and it, it worked out, you know? So I said, uh, I went and looked at some of the projects he did and, I said, this is amazing, bro. Let's fucking do it, right? So he'll walk into a house and tell me in 10 minutes how much it's going to cost, right? He'll give me a hard number on paper in 10 minutes, you know, depending on the house, maybe 15, 20, like, you know, but yep. that, day, that day you'll have a hard number on paper. So when I have a deal like that, you know, 
it's like, you know, th this house here that that um, I'm going to do the video of tomorrow that you've been seeing, um, I'm going to make about 20% on this house. When you split months. it, you split profit. No, with that's, him. After a... him. that's after paying him. I'm going to make oh, so about 20% you... profit on my money. You pay him first and then you are the one selling the house. Well, or you I, have a I, buy the house. I buy the house and then <clears> him, uh, for the rehab. And then, you know, you have to pay your realtor to list it and everything. Yep. Uh, if you want to do it that way, you know, sell it yourself, however you want to do it. Um, but, I've, you know, I have a realtor that helps me find deals. He's good. He has a lot of wholesale contacts, has a lot of um, um, a, a huge brokerage, you know, so he has people all over able to sell houses in any market. Um, so, yeah, so I'll just give you like, like raw numbers for this house, right? So we walk in, I bought, I, I found the deal. My realtor found the deal for me. We get it for 160 under contract, right? Cash. Okay, so I pay 160K for it. Um, my, my guy comes in, my, my contractor comes in. He said, okay, this is going to cost you 50K to rehab, right? So now I'm all in for 210. The realtor, before I, obviously like before I even did all this, I said, okay, what's this going to go for once it's rehabbed? You know, that's what we call the ARV, that the after repair value. So the after repair value is going to be about 290. He said, you know, quick sale, you know, you, you'll you get it sold um, in a weekend for 280. He said, you know, 290, maybe a week or whatever. Um, you know, so he's going to take uh, his uh, 6%, right? So that's about fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So, yeah, you, you, you could do the math, right? Like, like yeah. 60, 90, 70 grand. Yeah. 290, you know, we'll say, we'll say it's, um, we'll, we'll say it's, uh, 270 total, right? Say it's 20 grand. I don't know the exact math. Um, minus 210, and I'm profiting 60K. What's, uh, did you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? What got you into the real estate? <laughs> Um, I never actually read that book. My kids have read it. <laughs> I had them read it. Very good. Yeah. I, I know all the principles of the book, of course. Um, what so inspired actually, the real estate for you? So actually what originally got me into it was when I bought my first house. Um, I put three and a half percent down and this is in you know, like 2010 or 11 or something, you know, put three and a half percent down, live there for a couple of years. And then when I moved, I was like, um, I, you know, I got a, a bonus check from the UFC. Right? I, I don't remember which fight it was, but I got a bonus check. I said, okay. I said, okay, well now I got enough where I could put a down payment on a better house. So, okay. Do I sell this house or do I rent it? Right. And I looked at the rent, what it was going for around the area. I said, well, I, I think my mortgage was like 1100 at the time, but the rents were like 1500. And I said, well, that kind of makes sense. I can make 300 bucks a month. And, you know, this house is already worth a thousand more than I paid for it. You know, like this makes all the sense in the world. Right. So I just rented it out. And then, you know, it was probably a year or two. I'm like, dude, like I'm getting this money every month, you know, um, three, 400 bucks a month back then to me was, was a decent amount. You know, I was like, I was like, you know, that's a couple of date nights with the wife or whatever. Right. You know, yeah. I, you know, I just had the kids and everything. So I said, man, this, this is a, a decent amount. You know, this is paying for diapers and all kinds of shit. Um, I said, dude, I should fucking do this again. Yeah. I just started doing that. Again, I built up to about six properties. Um, I think I had six properties. And, um, and like I said, then we got divorced. And of course, it all goes out the window. So I said, okay, well, I got to redo this. And then, um, you know, I, I got to start from scratch, but I'm going to fucking do it again. Um, and then I started looking into the, uh, Airbnbs and you know that you can make a lot of money with the Airbnbs. You know, where's your Airbnbs? They were Texas or near like uh, I can't remember where I saw them. Okay, so I have one in Crystal Beach, Texas. Yeah. So any um, any of your listeners here want to rent in Crystal Beach, Texas? Send me a DM. At I am the immortal. Or if you want to go to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, I have a uh, a romantic cabin there. Oh, oh wow. wow. Who would have thought Matt Brown has a motherfucking romantic home? <laughs> Take my girl there about once a year. And it's also there's a heart shaped tub. You know, there's hearts. It's a honeymoon cabin, is what they call yeah. it. How'd and you find that spot? 
uh actually just a realtor hooked it yeah. up yeah it, it wasn't anything special and i was just searching for it and that's such a hot market for a vacation rentals you know that they're, they're for sale all the time it's just a matter of finding one that's a, a proper deal um with the interest rates today it's hard to find proper deals <clears throat> I didn't end up um like my one in in texas doesn't actually do as well as i had projected because when i i built it um a new construction and when i first went into contract with it i didn't have a locked interest rate you know when i said okay let's build this thing and the interest rates were still like three and a half or four percent and then over the year they blew up and you know i, I think i ended up at like six and a half or seven percent which i had you know three four hundred five hundred maybe even more i don't know i don't know the actual math but you know, added a significant amount and cut into my cash flow a lot. So I'm just kind of breaking even on that one. But, uh, but it, even with that, you know, you just, I just keep it as a long term play, right? Like it's, it's still gonna make money in the long run. That's what matters. And it's appreciating and, you know, they're paying off my mortgage. And that's the ticket paying off your mortgage. I, I've read that, uh, maybe I heard Robert Kiyosaki he said, uh, yeah. don't do the flip because then you got to pay taxes. He's like, but if you just keep well, renting them out. Yeah. Th there's, there is different schools of thought on that. And I'm sure he flips house, some houses. <laughs> it, it, I wouldn't doubt it. I would not <laughs> doubt it because so th there's kind of two different ways to look at it, right? There's a long-term and short-term, right? The flip is for a short-term um, cash game, flow, right? For instance, this house that I'm, I'm flipping, like, we'll just take that one. For instance, I gave you the numbers on it, right? I could go get a mortgage on it, um, twenty percent less than the two ninety that it's going to be valued at, um, whatever that would be, uh, two ninety, uh, about about sixty k minus two ninety, about two thirty. So my mortgage would be about two thirty, um, to probably about two thousand bucks a month. I think is what the mortgage would end up being, right? And at two thirty, I would still cash out maybe. You know, after closing costs and everything, maybe five or ten thousand dollars, right? So, and that they call that the Burr method, right? Buy, rent, or buy, rehab, rent, uh, refinance, repeat, right? They call it the Burr method, yep. okay? And that's perfectly fine to do that. Um, but for you to make, you know, let's say even after taxes, I'm gonna make thirty thousand dollars. Right. Just we'll just cut that 60K in half. Right. Um, say I make thirty thousand dollars under the Burr method or if I just went out and purchased it um, outright to make thirty thousand dollars is going to take five, six, seven years. Right. So that's what I said. The the rentals is like a long term thing. Yeah. That's, it's more of a store of value. Right. And you're it, expecting the appreciation and you're looking at 10, 15, 20 years down the road, it's something you can get. And the reason that I moved to the Airbnbs for the long-term thing is that now I could take my girl down to the romantic cabin. I could take her to the beach and I'm still making money. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I, no, got I love it. I live in a beach town, so I've seen what yeah, has happened. People. Yeah. Uh, you know, people, some people, well, we had the hurricane here, I think it was 11 years ago. So a lot of houses had to get rebuilt. And oh, yeah. uh, some people <clears throat> moved back in, other people rehabbed, and then they do a long-term rental from like the fall leading up until Memorial Day, which is much cheaper. But then when Memorial Day through Labor Day hits, like my town explodes. And, uh, you know, they'll do a week, two weeks, uh, a month or all summer long. And like, uh, you know, a week here could be 10 grand or more. Dude, I, I have to, what town are you in? I need to. It's called the uh, Manasquan. It's a little beach Manasquan. town. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah, a little, little beach town. Up there and visit, bring the kids up. Man. Oh, you'll, they'll love it. You know, it's a beach town. The kids, uh, surf <laughs> kids in this town are all on their bikes. So, uh, our house, is like close to doubled in value because once COVID hit, a lot of people didn't have to commute to New York City. So let's say somebody would normally buy maybe like a two bedroom apartment slash townhome in the city for one and a half million. Now they buy something 
maybe on the beach, you know, they built, they had to rebuild everything. So there's condos on the beachfront or houses, uh, but things, you know, my neighbor sold not this summer, the previous, they have a Cape. They sold it for 1.1 million, a Cape. Nice. The backyard is so small. Like it's not, it's like half the size of a wrestling mat. That's how little it is. So, yeah, but yeah, I'll send, I'll send you, uh, the address uh I'd love, yeah. I'd love to come up visit man put my yes. hard work they they actually love doing the hard work man though um you know they, they love pushing themselves uh it, it's funny because my one son he's a huge wrestler really good at it um and then my other son who's actually uh, more athletic and stronger and yeah bigger he's actually a huge golfer now yeah, well, that's the sport, baby. Golf and like, he got me loving golf, man. I'm all about the golf now. My 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 son plays golf, and uh, you'd be proud to know. Like the first time I took him golfing, a guy complained, and I was like, almost got into a fight on the golf course. And my son was very embarrassed. Till he's like, you know, that's not what you do. But I I, I fucking flipped out on some guy. So yeah, my son goes golfing, but I like to do that because. Man, you know, when you're a business owner, your mind is racing and you just want to do something to shut it down. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I, I started getting active just because my son is like, yeah. got into it. And it was just, I found, man, this is an amazing bonding experience with my son. Like just going out there and being outside, staying off the of phones. Yes. And, you know, you're playing a game, but man, golf courses are beautiful and it beautiful. just really fucking expensive is the only thing <laughs> yes there's uh by the way we go we always rent we go down to a place in south carolina called kiwa island oh my god it's beautiful and so um we rent bikes and then i uh just at least went to the driving range i think you couldn't play golf at this place unless you were a member but uh, this whole kiwa the whole thing is lots of uh townhomes and uh then there's homes, but tons of Airbnb or Ver VRBO stuff that you would love there. That is a riding your bike on the beach. Beautiful. Yeah, it is a beautiful thing, man. That uh, is beautiful. But what I was getting is, you know, my son, he loves the golf, but he, I, what he wants to be, and uh, uh, I'm all about this. He said he wants to be the most jack golfer that's ever been. Golfers are getting jacked now. They're realizing. They're starting, starting yeah. to, right? But I told him, I said, no, like, you're going to be fucking jacked, bro. You're going to be like the Arnold Schwarzenegger of golf. <laughs> you know? and, and I always thought about that. I was like, man, I mean, yeah, these guys are kind of jacked, but, you know, there ain't none that are fucking bulging, you know? They're starting, you know, it's interesting to see that sport is starting to realize, like, they, you know, kind of like what strength and conditioning is turning into a lot of pretty boy shit golf i feel is starting to go the other route of like hey we got a deadlift right. and yeah we need to we need to do strength exercises well, so I'll tell you uh, what, i think his name is brian day or jason day okay he's a re really uh you know top level pga golfer he came to west side oh wow i was talking with tom about it he said this guy fucking put it in he said he he put him through hell and he kept going. That's said, amazing. I wonder where he's from. Is he from Florida or something? I have no idea, actually. Yeah, that's Im that's impressive. I would like to do. Would love to do a part two with Tom on the podcast. I mean, we could really <laughs> dig deep on some stories, but I I, I don't want yeah, to. We have to ask Tom. We some, I, yeah. I'd like to have him on too and say, "Hey, Tom, what the fuck were you thinking on some of this?" <laughs> <laughs> when. Those early days, too, like I look back at how I trained athletes, but I think they were not, you know, the smartphone wasn't there was blackberries and flip phones. So right. kids were kids were going to bed on time. It's just a different thing today. You know, my wrestlers go to more than one club. They're just mm -hmm. constantly on the run. I feel like athletes are trying to survive. From one session to the next, they're kind of coasting rather than just fucking killing it. And just like, I got one strength coach, I got one wrestling coach, and I'm locked in. And You know, and, that, uh, that's interesting you say that because I'm always a little torn. And uh, maybe, you know, hearing your two cents on this, you know, where 
you know, I see all these other kids that they're in, you know, wrestling year round, or, you know, they're, they're competing against these kids that are in golf year round. And I'm like, dude, I kind of don't want my kid to do that. You know, I want him to be a kid too. Yes. And I want him to enjoy doing this. Cause I also see, you know, back at our generation, I'm sure you've seen many times, those were usually the kids that by the time they got to collegiate or, or, or high level high school, you know, they start falling off, right? They start, the injuries start getting to them. I've seen so many surgeries in college, you know, a lot of ACL and torn labrums as freshmen, or they're coming into college and they've already had yeah. ACL surgery. And so you don't preserve the body. I would conjugate the sport. I actually had a mom, her son is nine. He wrestles baseball and does flag football. Well, he, he she wanted him to, she's like, should I sign him up for football? It's 10 and under. She's like, I'm afraid he'll be too small. I'm like, here's what you do. In the fall, we have flag football. I go, let him play flag football every Sunday. I go in the fall uh, or the spring, sign him up for judo for three months. Yeah. Then he's then he'll do wrestling during the winter. Then he's in baseball. I go in the summertime, do what the kids of Manasquan do. They surf and they live at the beach. Yeah. When they're on the beach, they're playing volleyball. They're swimming. They're fucking running all over the sand. They're training and they don't even know it. But I said, do not wrestle, wrestle, wrestle. Do the judo. And when I was in high school, there were some kids, you know, I found out about it later that were going to that judo club where uh, coach Yanni Zuka was. And they had underhooks and inside trips and they would throw, you know, who went there, Steve Mako, American top team. Yeah. With oh, all yeah. The yeah, man. So like, we didn't know why, why they're throwing headlocks and they're doing like weird throws. Then I find out, you know, 15 years later, because I trained a guy when I opened my first gym, he was an instructor from the Cranford Judo Club. And I start mentioning names. He's like, oh, I remember them. They came in when they were kids. Mm. So the, the, and it's basically what, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Louis wrote or uh, Tom wrote a book and had Louis like write it. Tom Saylor, the judo guy. John Saylor, yeah. John Sale. Yeah, he wrote. Yeah, I got the book. Yep. I love that book. And uh, I've seen a video tour of his gym. It's like his house. Um, yep. And it's he created, built, you know, welded equipment, stuff that probably, you know, like your family would be able to have done. But uh, that is what I like to see. And then. Well, there's I, a know, little bit. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't interrupt. But oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say there's a little bit. So just talking about my own kids here a little bit you know they do get a little disappointed sometimes when they're behind in these sports too right yes particularly in the wrestling because this sucks to lose at wrestling right like oh, ohio is also probably one of the toughest ohio pa Ohio's is one, one of the, the toughest. toughest yeah and, and then you know i see the same with, with my son in golf right and you know the, there's these kids out there that are you know i mean they're, they're shooting fucking below 40 regularly i'm like I'm like, dude, how much fucking golf is he playing? You know, and and I'm always torn between, okay, do I get him in that deep, you know, so their confidence will be better, or do I keep holding them back like they probably should be, but then I risk, you know, them losing their confidence and losing their motivation and drive to continue the sport. Right. So I feel like wrestling, you know, it's so much tougher on the body and the mind, as you know, as a fighter. But in golf, I have a bad day. Listen, when I always say this is the difference, my daughter plays tennis, right? It's a one-on-one -on -one, and I wrestled. Let's say I lost a wrestling match. I'd be like, fuck this. I'm not fucking eating dinner. I'm going to run five miles. You know, my son loses a baseball game. We're looking for where to go get ice cream. <laughs> That's yeah. like such a different. So wrestling, I feel like he will catch up. What I've noticed is the kids are not as strong. They're just very skilled but they lack fucking basic general strength. And so that starts to catch up with them in a negative way. They have these high skill, but they're just not strong. And in high school, strength is crazy important. Matter, yeah. they marry it with skill, and now they both elevate each other. So in golf, you know, the only concern is you're constantly rotating one way. So you just need to train to offset and make sure the back is strong and healthy. But I think in wrestling, if you're wrestling so much, it 
it's very hard to preserve the body. And, you know, listen, only six or seven percent will compete in college, you know, with the sport of wrestling. But look, I'm still in pain. I'm 48 from things I did at age 16, (laughs) you know. So when you train too much the wrong way, it backfires on you. And I believe that that's why I think judo gets you better at wrestling right and then uh strength train twice at you know twice a week year round is like not asking a lot but it preserves the body it's not too much and then your son could do another sport he could you know run spring track he could also play golf so you got two boys getting each other better at golf yeah i like it i like it yeah I've, i've tried to get him in judo so much we have a judo class in my gym and he just does not want to fucking do it i'm uh i'm about to just push him in there one day but you're fucking doing it but yeah we have we have one down by us um the guy was a national champ and i'm shocked that more wrestlers are not doing right. it because the, it's just a different culture you know different yeah body. it's different it, it it's uh I think it could be pretty, pretty painful. Then it's the yeah. fact of learning something new. And then parents are afraid, hey, <clears throat> we might take a step back. Well, you know, they go from now they're in freestyle and Greco. So that's the other thing. I like I like freestyle and Greco. But, uh, you know, my son used to wrestle. But if he was still wrestling, then I would say after the season, we're taking a break. Me, you know, if you want to do freestyle and Greco, OK, but we're going to do judo for three months out of the year. So you learn a different style and you're going to do another sport. You know, he loves baseball. My son loves baseball. My daughter plays tennis year round, which is, I wish she would do another sport. She would, she's done softball and she was great at it. But then that's the other thing with parenting, Matt is we're going to guide, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a mistake and try to learn something from it. Uh, It's very hard for parents to coach the kid oh god yeah i heard that and i coach my son in kickboxing just because i don't trust anyone else to do it and he he loves uh muay thai i love know, that coach him in that and he that's what he loves the most actually but tell me if you're on the same page with me here my son just signed up for my golfing son just signed up for baseball for the first time this year i've been to two games now out in the you know 80 degree heat and this is the most miserable fucking sport to watch <laughs> could ever possibly imagine. You're out there for two goddamn hours. Yes. And your son gets about two minutes of action. Yeah. Now he pitched one time and I was like, all right, well, this is a little bit better at least. But I'm like, you know, and, and all you hear is every parent like, like good cut, good eye crazy shit they say yeah you bent the ball like i listen it's uh, one thing i do know with, yeah with baseball is you know i've gone through all this travel stuff i just posted a video on it and i've had many coaches say yeah we're gonna move your kid around he's gonna play different positions we're gonna develop him when my son was in third grade the fucking coach never moved him from the outfield but his oh. son was always <clears throat> Shortstop, first pitcher, oh, yeah. <clears throat> and you need coaches that could move the kids around and develop them, and then the kids have to swing a lot on their own. So, like my son goes in the backyard. We have a tee and a net, and if you don't have a good game, I always tell him, I go, "That's on you." You know, you need to go out and swing if you want to get better. And then look, we we take them to we invest a lot in our kids because I don't know anything about the sport. So if he, if it makes him more confident to do a private hitting lesson, pitching lesson, I do all that shit. You know, we spoke about getting a coach earlier, but um, in the early years, because I didn't coach, he was given the shaft. You know, he would be sitting in the dugout. He would be getting skipped. And he grew up in my gym seeing other kids working. And -hmm. I think he learned that hard work is normal activity. It's yeah, normal. Right. And if you want to be a winner, then winners are workers. There's no such thing as a fucking lazy, you know, there's some lazy people who are successful, but they're, they're fucking working <clears throat> in some sort of strategic manner, but he learned to work. And so he'll train with us. 
He goes to the gym with a friend that he used to wrestle with who still wrestles. So he ends up kind of training like a wrestler. So they lift heavy. And I tell him, like, in season, you want to keep that power? You need to squat. You got to deadlift. You got to pull the sleds. So he has that. But I also say, listen, I'm not dragging you to the gym. It's up to you to train as hard as you want to win. I might have to write that on the wall at the gym. Winners are workers. I I say it all the time. Yeah. No such thing as lazy and successful. That's what I tell. So I tell him, but listen, my bro, I I crushed your time, man. I told you we were going to go 45 minutes. (laughs) What's so um, let's, let's uh, mention some places. I I follow you on Instagram, but what are some ways that uh, people can connect with you and uh, reach out, reach out to you for anything? Yeah, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook are the big ones. I am the immortal on Instagram and Twitter. Of course, uh, Facebook, the immortal Matt Brown. Um, I have a TikTok now at I am the immortal, but I only post my guitar playing videos on there. Oh, nice. I try to keep my Instagram more on brand, um, but I'll post some guitar stuff on there. uh, Yep. Um, People can reach out to you for the uh, Airbnb in Tennessee. And uh, what's that area in Texas? It's on the water, right? Oh, Crystal Beach. It's right next to uh, Galveston. Yes. Yep. Is that where they do like a lot of spring break action happens down there or no? There's a lot of spring breaking going on down there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I've it's, seen it on. It's um... cool because they have uh, 27 miles in Crystal Beach, not in Galveston. They have 27 miles of drivable beach. So you can actually take your Jeep or your forerunner, whatever you got, and take it out on the beach and drive a little uh, Probably, I think I've seen the area on those like uh, house hunting shows. My okay. wife loves it; yeah. she loves okay. to watch that stuff. So beautiful air, my man. This was great. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Strong Life. Leave a review, share this, follow our boy Matt and uh, Matt. Uh, just hang tight. I want to just chat with you for thirty seconds before we shut it down. Uh, and again, thanks to everybody for watching and listening. We'll talk to you guys soon. Matt, stand by.